Createx Candy 2.0, when mixed with our UVLS Gloss 4050, can be used to create a variety of custom textures and finishes, including this ground aluminum panel technique. Hey guys, welcome back to the booth at Createx Colors. I'm Chris Arpin, and we are going to do a ground aluminum candy panel and talk about the techniques to, to do a ground aluminum panel. So a couple steps, certain things that you can do to get a finished product, something similar, like this. Uh, we originally did these, I did these as a project here at Createx Colors for our loading dock doors, and uh, we wanted to do something a little cooler than just a paper number. So I did one through seven, uh, all over ground aluminum. So I'm gonna show you guys kind of my technique, my take on it, a couple tips and tricks to help you guys produce a panel just like this. Okay guys, first things first, you need a panel. So once you have your panel, this is just a normal powder coated panel that you get from any, any art supplier or any, anybody uh, that's out there. Uh, you're gonna wanna strip the coating, which is usually powder coat, off. And for that, I just use a DA with 80 grit, just nice, quick, there's not a lot of material on there, but you want a nice, even surface to work off. So once that is done, this is kind of just an example of kind of a couple different techniques that I use on every single one of those numbers. So we kind of have an engine turned technique. This is more of just a random seaweed -y kind of just random orbit action. Uh, this is a little more consistent, doing like a lines, a little bit of curve. And then this bottom one is more of like a seaweed -y kind of you can see, I don't know if you'll be able to see how, how well that is. But once you put candy over the top of that, it changes dynamically. It's, it's really crazy how it looks. It really shows like the highlights and the low lights and, and that texture. This is also a great thing for doing for backgrounds. If you had that ability to, to work on an aluminum panel like that and you wanted some, some background color or, or a little more character and depth without getting too crazy, this is a great technique for that as well. So we'll start with, like I said, the, the actual technique. And there are, this is just a couple examples. It's, it's really up to you. All you gotta do is start playing around. The easiest thing to do, if you have access to a decent sized air compressor, a little grinder like this, you don't have to get a crazy expensive one because you're not trying to do anything in terms of body work. You're just trying to create texture. So low RPM with a roll lock disc. Those are in one inch up to three inch. So Usually the medium, the, the medium uh, red roll locks are the ones that are preferred because it's aggressive enough to create texture but not really dig into the panel. That's the last thing you wanna do is make deep ruts. Or if you don't have a lot of air, you can get yourself a four and a half inch angle grinder. You can, again, you can get a cheap grinder for like 20 bucks and you don't need something crazy because all you're trying to do is create texture. Low pressure, this is a, an example of like a, uh, one of those wheels. There's, there's the one I have on here. I think this is the equivalent of a 180 and this is a 320. So you can also vary your background or your pattern by the actual grit and what and how, how you kind of move across the panel and you can just get, again, creative and you can do a lot of cool things and create a lot of different effects with just the texture and, and the actual pan, uh, scotch pad as well. So once you're done with that, you're gonna wanna just go ahead and wipe it down. It's clean when you're doing this, wear gloves. You don't want contamination on the aluminum. So the aluminum's gotta be clean and clean and clean. So for this, I don't use a super aggressive wax and grease remover. A lot of times some of the wax and grease removers that are out there are too aggressive and it'll actually start closing up the pores in the aluminum and actually makes it worse to paint on. You're actually adding contamination. So if you're wiping your panel and you see that your cloth is turning black, it's not good. So actually for these, I use a product from PPG, again, uh, SX103, it's an alcohol wipe. So it's basically a denatured alcohol with some other stuff in there, but it's a fast evaporating, aggressive enough to clean off surface contamination, but not so aggressive that it starts to attack the aluminum because aluminum is very soft. So once you're good and clean and wiped down, the key to this working is a couple coats of our 4050, our UVLS gloss 4050. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a couple coats over the top of this, and then once you have that done, it's time to go to step two. So I'm gonna get this set up, and we're gonna start spraying a little bit of 4050. Hi right, guys, we are back. My panel's all mounted and wiped down, ready to go. One of the things I actually kind of forgot about actually was our 4013 reducer. Because there is some alcohol in that, it's a synthetic alcohol that's in that reducer, um, that would work as well. Again, because it's just enough to clean the surface, but not too aggressive to really start etching that aluminum. So wipe down, tacked off, 4050, 15%, uh, 4011. I'm spraying it through a smaller tip size, so I went around 15%, but 10 to 15, that's what we're talking about. I'm gonna do two coats. All I wanna do is put a medium wet coat on this, just to kind of fill in the grain 
get adhesion. So we're gonna let this sit, and once that's done, then we'll start our arbor after that, but that is key to let this sit for at least, at least an hour, but for these, we're gonna let these sit overnight. So if you can do that, it's preferred. All right, guys, when we left off yesterday, I just finished wrapping up two coats of our UVLS, our 4050 UVLS gloss. And uh, I mentioned dry times, right? So I said at least an hour. And the reasoning I said an hour for this particular application was if you noticed, I did not really pound on two heavy wet coats. And I only did two coats, I didn't do three. Uh, these were medium coats. And it is imperative to let this dry as much as possible, especially because we're putting it over aluminum. We really want that product to lock down. So one hour and those are like perfect conditions 70 degrees 50 percent humidity we have a controlled environment in the booth right now it's summer humidity is higher temperatures are a little all over the place in terms of rain and wetness and, and humidity so you got to keep that in mind so perfect conditions at least one hour if you can wait longer better if you can wait overnight that's even better and the only reason i want to show you that is for this exact reason right here this is a little bit of duct tape and we're going to put it on this panel right here and I just want to demonstrate the grip of this product over the aluminum. That is not coming off. There is nothing there. Uh, that is actually, if you can see that, there's actually duct tape residue. The glue is still stuck on the panel. So that is just a good indication of what it is I'm talking about. I really let this product dry and it is going to be a bulletproof work surface for you to start your artwork on top of, especially when doing a ground aluminum or a panel such as this. So I'm gonna put this aside because that was just kind of a demo. Uh, we're gonna talk about the actual layout and the design. So when we started, you guys saw, I had this panel behind me. So this has already been ground. I just did a random swirl on it and I put two coats of the 4050 down and then I started spraying their candy. So when you guys came in, I was actually finishing this last coat of candy. So what I did was I did a little bit of a fade with our Tealicious. And then I faded that into our ultraviolet. And then from there, it went to our sunset magenta. And I always work light to dark because it's a lot easier to build and, and, and get that fade. And, and the trick is when you're doing this, the only time I will tell you guys to spray a little wet on wet, because what you're trying to do with that candy is to get it to melt together rather than be overspray on the top. You don't want to see a droplet. You don't want to see that overspray because it'll start to get grainy. And you want a real nice seamless, seamless, transition between colors. So when I'm spraying this, it's actually a reduction that's closer to four to one because it's a smaller panel. So I did four parts 4050 to one part candy and just slowly build up your coats. So it's very easy to work that color and build a gradation from light to dark or from one color transition to the next. Again, like what you can see here, this is three colors that I use of candy but it really looks like five. It actually has a tequila look, almost a carob blue look right here to a deep purple and then back to sunset. So that's the beauty of being able to kind of work that candy, not soaking wet. I'm not over applying it. I sprayed it the same way I did when I sprayed the, uh, the 4050, kind of a medium wet coat, but I just had another color that I was able to switch right to my gun. I didn't clean the gun out from the color that was left behind. I went right to the next color and began spraying. And that kind of helps with that nice, even kind of seamless transition. So. You let that dry. Uh, again, that was about two hours for that to dry. But again, this has been overnight now since we left it. Uh, so this is totally solid and ready for me to work on. And I'm actually not gonna top coat this with anything. This is the candy mix with the 4050. And it actually has extremely good uh, fingerprint resistance and, and all of that. So I'm gonna tape right on top of this. So the reasoning, real quick, the reasoning for me spraying the entire panel candy is I'm gonna work positive negative, right? So I, have that six as an example right here. Rather than outlining this and spraying the candy on the inside over an existing background, it's gonna be way easier for me to actually cover that entire panel with the candy and then do a positive graphic. So tape off the actual six and then spray the outside. And it's real easy. I did silver sealer and a little bit of our brand new uh, wicked charcoal, our 359 charcoal metallic to get the fade on the outside. That's all that is. The sealer covers extremely well. And I'm actually not super concerned if I get a little bit of candy bleed coming through that silver because it kind of creates a little highlight and low light. 
right? So I'm not super concerned if I spray the candy, uh, spray the silver over this candy and it starts to turn a little bit, that's okay because we're just trying to punch out that sharpness of that number or the letter, whatever it is that you're gonna do. So I'm gonna go ahead and start spraying, or uh, start masking this out. This is just regular vinyl mask, vinyl transfer paper. Uh, we'll put it over the top. Try to land this in the center. We're gonna squeegee that out. For this one, since we did one through six, and my door is half, uh, I'm gonna do a number eight since we don't have one of those yet. So number eight. So the, the trick is let this kind of fall naturally. You don't want to. Uh, cause any kind of wrinkles and creases and just work to the outside. And once that's done, what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and kind of back tape the edge of these panels with a little bit of masking paper. So, gotta determine what's the top and what's the bottom. So I'm gonna work from, from light to dark. I like the look of that. I always try to keep everything, even graphics and fades and colors working from light to dark, especially where, where gravity would naturally pull it. It kind of just helps the overall look of the artwork. It looks a little more natural and real rather than having funky shadows like dark on top and light on the bottom. I always try to work light to dark. So what I did was just took a pencil and just kind of roughly sketched out the eight. Well, in this case, I didn't do that yet, but the eight. So I have my rough idea of how I want this to look. And I kind of want to use a majority of the panel, use as much as we can to really fill that panel in. So just loosely sketch my eight. And you can see I kind of did like a, kind of a ragged, kind of a tribal style. So what I did was I did just the kind of the, the center of where I want my design. And then I went back and kind of filled in where I want my cuts and my jagged edges. And on these guys, all I did actually, these were pinstriped um, on the edges. And for that, I actually used one shot, uh, pinstriped it afterwards. So I'm not super concerned in doing a fine line tape out. I'm not super worried to, to have a really, really sharp paint line because anything that you don't like, if it is a little fuzzy from using the, the mask paper, uh, you're gonna be able to hide that with a pinstripe. Now, if you did wanna do a painted stripe, you could totally do that too. What, what I would recommend would be when you get your first, I'll just show this again. For this layout, it would be harder to do this kind of tribal kind of dagger stroke pinstripe. But what you could do is once this is all solid taped, let's put another uh, layer of tape over that once you spray a base coat color. So if I had, let's say this was a six and I wanted a blue stripe like this, I would go ahead and spray blue just around the edge with my airbrush until I got a decent amount of coverage. And then I would go back and outline that with an eighth inch or three sixteenths or sixteenth inch tape, whatever you want to do, quarter inch if you want it really big, tape over that, and then proceed to spray the sealer silver and then your charcoal. And what was going to happen is when you pull that tape, that'll have your blue for your pinstripe. So that's a, a, if you guys don't want a pinstripe or you want a, a cleaner kind of a stripe, a nice solid stripe, that's another option. You guys can do that. If you really want to, you could take the time and you could kind of replicate that jagged stripe with just pinstripe and tape as well, or fine line tape as well, and it would take a little bit longer, but you could definitely pull that off and then it would be a, a painted stripe instead. So I'm gonna go ahead, get the rest of this sketched out, and we will see you guys when I'm ready to spray. Okay guys, we are back, and uh, we kind of tried to give you guys a different angle so you can actually see, rather than just listen to me talk <laughs> about what it is I'm doing, you actually see it. So I went ahead and added two pieces of uh, tape because I wanted to fill, again, I wanted to fill that space in. So I was able to kind of bring this eight out a little bit further to the edge of the panel. I really want this to be the focal point of the panel. So I want it as big as I can without making it look too distorted. So like I said, I went ahead and I did a loose sketch of my eight. And then once I kind of have that space filled the way I like it, I just came back with my Sharpie and you can use anything. You don't have to use a Sharpie. I just use a Sharpie because it's really easy to see and actually started my kind of freehand tribal 
uh, design. And it works really well to kind of do all your mock-up first in pencil or something, a different color, so you don't have to erase it. You can just kind of keep saying, I, I don't like this right here, I don't like this over here, kind of like dig it better here. Actually, my cameraman was able to help me out and actually kind of say, hey, I think that would look better. So uh, big props to Jake on that. Uh, for helping me out and giving me direction or where this needed to go. Uh, so then once it's done, then I kind of came back and added my, my tribal style kind of jagged edge. And it's just real simple. It's the same thing. It's just how does it flow? You know, there's no right or wrong reason. There's no method really other than trying to make sure it's not super cookie cutter and real symmetrical, but it still has some balance. So you don't want one side to be more jagged than the other side. You kind of want to match both just so it looks... Uh, visually balanced. So now that that's done, like I said, this is going to be my positive. I'm going to leave the eight and then pull off the outside because I'm going to reverse mask it, which is way easier. So this candy fade will stay within this, and then we're just going to come back and darken this up. And the fact that this is already going to be positive masked is going to make it extremely easy to go back and do my drop shadows as well because I already have this covered, so I'll be able to come in and highlight and low light all my, my shadows, and it's going to be way easier because I'm not going to have to worry about getting my uh, drop shadow color back on the 8. So I'm going to go ahead and start cutting this. I, I just try to stick one point, and I really try not to pick my knife up after my cut. What I'll do is actually, in this case, it's easy enough. I'll just kind of spin my panel. So when I pull it off, it's real nice and easy because the key to using this kind of a mask is A, always use a fresh blade and try to keep even pressure because the last thing you want to do is start cutting into your existing paintwork. So it might look like I'm really bearing down on this, but I am not. It's just light pressure, letting the weight of the knife do the work, and just kind of moving around the shape. And again, as I'm doing this, I'm kind of just letting my hand dictate the line that I'm going to take. I'm actually, I mean, I'm going to follow my guideline, but if it's a little inside, if it's a little outside, it's going to look way more natural if you can just write a nice flowy line than if you're trying to follow that line exactly. Sometimes it comes up and it looks a little staccato. It'll have a little jump to it. There's no reason that you just, this is, again, I'm pretty close to where I'm going. It's, it's just a general guideline. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish cutting this out. And we will see you guys when I'm ready to start spraying. So stay tuned. Okay, guys, we're back. I um, actually figured we would take the opportunity to show you guys me uh, untaping this. So exactly what we were talking about is you guys get the idea in terms of what I was meant when I said positive mask. We're going to leave this positively taped. So all the stuff on the outside is, at this point, scrap. So again, this is going to make it way easier to do the drop shadows and, and everything else because when I go back with my airbrush, let's say right here and right here, and the bottoms of all these, it's already covered with mass. I don't have to worry. I can actually carry my drop shadow from here and work to the outside. And then from here, I can stay to the inside and kind of ride this line because I don't have to worry about getting overspray on what I want to stay essentially candy. So that is a benefit of this. And, and really, the, the whole reasoning behind it is because we are layering way more material when we're spraying the candies. Again, you know, two, three, four coats of candy is going to build up this value. And if we were doing it on the inside of this, you're going to bridge all these lines. You're going to have candy because we're mixing it with 40, 50. It's going to get really thick. And when you start untaping this, you run the risk of pulling those edges a little bit. So it's a lot easier to have the whole background sprayed with the candy, build up your edge as a whole with the candies. And then it, again, it's going to take a, a half a coat of our Autoborn Silver Sealer and then come back with our metallic charcoal. And I'm, that's just what I did for these because I really wanted to pop the number forward. You guys don't have to do that. Again, it's completely up to you and what color you would choose to do your background. But for me, I like just a neutral color because it doesn't take away from the candy itself and what we're trying to push forward as a number. Again, these numbers were done for the loading docks here at uh, Createx. The guys were busting my butt for a while 
they wanted me to paint the doors and I just didn't have time to paint the doors and I came in one day and one of the guys was putting a paper number on, <laughs> on the door and I was like, all right, we can't have that. So I started one and one turned into seven <laughs> and now here we are doing number eight. We don't have eight doors, but we're just, I just figured the next number would be eight, so we're gonna do eight. So uh, you guys can see what exactly we got going on. This is almost the last part of the masking. And we are ready to spray. Now when I spray, again, I'm gonna mix my 4011 uh, in with our Autoborn Silver Sealer. So the Silver Sealer cover is fantastic. And again, because it is light, when I spray, I'm just gonna kinda follow the edge of this, right? And I'm not super concerned if some of this color does because it is candy. If it bleeds into the silver a little bit, that's cool because it's gonna just be a lighter shade and that's all I'm trying to do is kinda help punch this number out and push the rest of this into the background. So not worried about the candy bleed. That's kinda the beauty part of something like this where I'm not trying to do a white line over blood red candy where you're gonna get a white line that's gonna start to turn pink and that's not what we want. But for this, it doesn't matter at all. So I am going to set this back up on our stand and uh, show you guys how I put down the silver sealer. All right guys, we are almost ready to spray, but I wanna take a quick second. Uh, I know I mentioned talking about the pinstriping, right? So before we got into it, I figured I would show you guys for the, those of you who aren't really familiar with what it was I was talking about. Um, if you wanted to do a tape stripe, if you didn't want to pinstripe it by hand, what you would do would be to choose your background color or your pinstripe color. And you would just kind of go with your airbrush and spray the edge of all this, right? Let that dry and then come back and with an eighth inch or 16th, whatever, whatever width tape you would want, you would follow this profile, right? So basically just follow the edge. Uh, we'll just do this one little lick right here. Follow the edge of this eight, right? And then I would just come back on the inside here as well and outline, ride the line of the mask, right? You'd have to clean that up, make a nice point, but you would go ahead and follow the whole outline of this eight with the fine line tape. And what that'll do is, this will give you an exact eighth inch stripe on the edge of this because you would have the color that you chose. So like, let's say again, like let's say you chose this light blue, this robin's egg blue, that would be all around. You would tape over this and then you would go and uh, mix your silver and spray your silver over that and then do the charcoal to, to burn the edge. And then when you pull this tape off, you would have that blue pinstripe on the outside edge. The only thing you wanna do when you do that is if you're using eighth inch and you're bordering this mask, you're gonna to wanna to kinda of come back whether you do it with masking tape or another eighth inch stripe, you're gonna kinda of wanna bridge those two just so you don't get any paint creeps. You'd actually wanna go back over this just to make sure that you're riding the edge of your masking paper and your fine line tape so you don't get any color bleeding through because you have these little sharp pin needle lines that'll be in the color of going through that tape. So. That's another option. It would take a little bit longer, but it's still totally doable. Um, and, and for those of you that don't want to pinstripe, or if you, if you can't pinstripe, or you just want a nice, sharp, clean looking color, it's another option to do pinstriping with, with metallics as well. A lot of the metallic pinstriping paint, it doesn't always look metallic, it kind of, because you're doing it with a brush. Um, and again, for, for this, we used, uh, for I used one shot. Um, I'll get into that afterwards when we're all done, but there's a lot of different striping enamels out there, striping paints. So uh, we're gonna stop this right now. We'll bring this close to the board and I'll show you guys uh, the application of our silver sealer. All right guys, panel is all tacked off, ready to go. I got my silver sealer, 10% 4011, uh, LPH 80, with a 1, 2, 15 PSI, around around 15 PSI. And I'm gonna spray my silver sealer.
right. You can see exactly what I was talking about. That was like one and a half coats of silver. It is not very thick. It's actually almost already dry at the top here. That's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to block that color out. And if any of these darker candies do bleed, it's not a big deal. It's gonna add to the effect. It'll look pretty cool because it'll soften that edge. So we're gonna let this dry. And I'm gonna mix up my Wicked Metallic Charcoal and come back and just kind of fog the edges and kind of build a little bit of depth in between here and just kind of airbrush the edge. And then the last step, once that's dry, is gonna be just doing our drop shadows. And for that, I'm gonna use a little bit of Wicked Detail Black and then we're gonna call this one done. So stick around, we're gonna let this dry and uh, we'll be back with our Charcoal Metallic. All right guys, we are back. Silver Sealer is pretty much totally dry one of two reasons. One, I put it on really light, like I said, about a coat and a half. You can actually see too, now it's starting to bottom here. We got a little bit of that color bleeding in. But again, not worried about it. It's just gonna add to that effect. And the other reason it dried fast is I got a new little toy from our friends at RTI, and it's this little fan dryer, and it's awesome. If you guys have seen our other videos, we do have a big Becca air drying system in the booth, which is, is awesome, but not everybody has that in their studio. Uh, sometimes those big air dryers, those air movers, the hair dryer looking ones, are a little bit overkill if you don't have a really big air compressor. This is a very cool little dryer. It's got a blade essentially at the end here, and all these little holes, so it's really forcing the air coming over the surface, and it's gonna, gonna really, really, uh, I don't wanna say compact the air, but it's gonna help kind of compress that air even more to move it over the surface. And it's got a little regulator on it. So again, we're always talking about air movement. You don't wanna jam right on it. You just wanna pass. And this is the same air pressure that I had on my LPH80. So it's not massive, but it's enough that I can move over the surface and it's really gonna help dry this that much faster. So big shout out to the guys at RTI. You guys check these out. These are really cool. It's also got a magnet on the back so you can stick it to anything that's, this is aluminum, but uh, the back of my stand's metal, that's gonna hold it no problem. So it's always within reach. So again, big shout out to RTI. So that is totally dry. We are going to spray our last color, which is our Wicked Charcoal Metallic. I got it mixed up, same way, 10% 4011. I turned my fan control in a little bit just to kind of concentrate this, because all I want to do is kind of just burn the edge and kind of fade in a little bit. I'm trying to keep a little bit of the silver halo because we're going to go back and do our drop shadows on that. So I kind of want to have the mindset of lighter on the top, a little darker on the inside, right? So lighter on the top edges and darker towards the inside and towards the bottom. So that is what I'm going to do next. That is it, simple as that. So we're gonna let this dry, and uh, we'll come back and do our drop shadows with our detail, our Wicked Detail Black, and then we'll just burn that very outside edge of the black to kind of push that into the background, and that's gonna pretty much wrap up this project. So we're gonna let this dry, and we'll be back with our Wicked Detail Black. All right, guys, welcome back. This is totally dry, the silver and the uh, metallic charcoal is dry. And we're gonna come back in for that last step and just kind of burn the edge. When I say burn the edge, I mean just kind of ride the edge with a little bit of black and kind of frame that out. And then come in and do our drop shadows. Uh, for that, I'm just using Wicked Detail Black. And I know I typically don't recommend using straight black for a drop shadow, just because it has a tendency to look a little fake. A lot of times I'll mix uh, Detail Purple and detail black together to kind of get a just a, a lighter, kind of a smoky look. Uh, or a lot of times I'll use transparent red oxide and a little bit of black as well. And it kind of gives just a more natural shading color. But for these panels and for this technique, it actually doesn't work terribly bad. So we're going to use that because it's real simple right out of the bottle. Uh, right around 20%, 4011. This is a 0.35 Eclipse. So it's going to spray nice and even. We're just going to ride the top of this. Burn 
the top, come down, do this a couple times until we get it how we like it. And that's what I mean by burn the edge, it's just kind of taking that panel and just giving a, the illusion of a shadow. So we're going to go ahead and do that and then come back in and do our drop shadows. And again, when you guys are doing drop shadows, if you've seen the other videos that Craig Frazier and, and Scott McKay have done with us, they're always talking about being conscious of your light source, like imagining that, all right, if the sun is up here, your light source is up here, it's going to cast a shadow this way. So you don't want to have shadows here. You want them all to be down the bottom, right? And you have to imagine that, that light source. So knowing where you are, not getting lost, and if you start doing a shadow here and a shadow here, it's just going to look funky. It's not going to be balanced. So you, you always want to kind of keep in mind when you pick your light source, whether it's going to be off to the side casting a shadow, off to this side casting a shadow, you can actually see the lighting in here, what, what it would do. Um, or across the top coming down, you know that this is all going to be lighter and these would all be darker, but it wouldn't be like way out here because it's not focusing light to create a shadow here. It would be a little bit shorter of a shadow. So when you're doing that, just kind of keep that in mind and it's going to help the, the work look a little bit more natural and, and more realistic in terms of that shadow. And there's no reason to go ahead and you, you're not trying to pound a dark shadow like that. We want to keep it nice and light. So you just a couple passes. It should be a little bit darker as it comes into the edge and kind of fade off to a soft edge on the outside. It's going to make it look natural. So with that being said, we'll start with that one right there. We're just going to kind of come into here just like that. And then now the, the bottom here, come in the top. And that's it. So we have a nice soft line. It'll get a little darker to, towards the body of this eight and then kind of fade off the tip to, to give that illusion that it is floating. So I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of these. And we will let this dry up. And we'll see you guys in a little bit. All right guys, we're back and this is totally dry and that is pretty much it for this project. The only thing left to do is to uh, go back and hit my outlines with my pinstripe. So we're gonna let this dry up and I will come back and start striping a little bit and uh, that is gonna wrap this up. So we'll see you guys once the stripes are done. All right guys, we are back. I did all the striping. It is all completely done. Uh, for this, I chose to use a, a daylight blue color. Uh, it's real similar to that number six that I showed you guys earlier. So just kind of a real loose kind of graphic type pinstripe. And uh, I wanted to, I, I said I was going to touch on that and cover that a little bit. Um, I use OneShot. Uh, now if you guys are familiar with OneShot, you know it's an enamel base. Uh, it's kind of designed to go over the surface of a clear coat. But you can do it under clear. There's a couple things you have to do. Um, the only reason I really use OneShot is because that's what I have here and I don't do a lot of striping. So there are plenty of other products out there that are urethane based that are designed to go underneath the clear coat. So there's a bunch of different companies that make it, a whole bunch of different colors. But again, if you're going to do OneShot, um, I always use a little bit of the hardener that I use in my clear coat. So like like a 2%, 5%, a couple drops in, in like an ounce. Um, and what that does is it kind of helps kick that one shot over and it, it also helps because it's the same material, it's the same hardener you're gonna use in your clear so you, you, you don't have an adverse reaction in terms of like an oil and water kind of thing. So uh, one shot actually recommends waiting eight hours before you top coat. Uh, if you're doing something like that, they actually have it on their website. Um, and the first two coats of clear that you put down the first coat goes on a medium, uh, second coat, like, and wait a long time between coats, almost basically to the point where it's dry to the touch. The second coat goes on medium, and then once you kind of have that barrier there, uh, then you can go ahead with a normal coat of clear, you know, go two or three coats on the top of that. And that's just to try to slowly build up and kind of acclimate the clear over that stripe. I've done this for a long time and I've never had issues uh, with any kind of a fish eye or any kind of a funky reaction with the one shot. The only time it's ever happened is if I've cleared it too soon. So like a lot of other products, you know, if you try to squeeze those time windows, you're just going to cause more issues. So that basically brings the end of that. We're going to let this dry up eight hours and uh, we're going to clear it. So uh, we, if we get a chance, we'll, we'll show you guys the final product, you know, with the clear on it. But once this is cleared, I, I know it's hard to see here in the booth you will really see 
these effects through the candy. It's really going to increase that transparency and it's going to really have a cool, cool depth and dimension to it. So what we also thought, that's why the booth is running right now, um, earlier I discussed blending the candies, right? And I, I said I kind of, this is the only time I kind of go wet on wet. And uh, I figured what better time than actually show you guys, because we already had that candy. And the only reason we did that was just so it was dry enough to actually show the, the graphic portion of it. But I have the panel that I did the 4050 on, and I figured we could show you that right now with a little bit of the candy. So I have my Tealicious mixed up, four to one. So four parts 4050, one part teal, and just a shot of uh, 4011 reducer, just to thin it down a little bit. I'm spraying it through an LPH 80, so a little smaller tip size. If I was spraying it through a full size gun, like a 1.3 or 1.4, I don't really recommend candies with a 1.4. 1.3 is pretty good. Um, I probably wouldn't have to reduce it. So four to one, I have it in my gun. It's my LPH 80, and I'm gonna do a couple passes, and then what I'm gonna do is, as soon as I'm done with my teal color, I'm gonna go right to my uh, deep uh, ultraviolet. <laughs> That's the ultraviolet that I use. It kind of actually ended up looking like carob blue right here and a little bit of deep purple when I went over the sunset magenta. So I don't have the sunset magenta. I figured I'll show you guys to get the idea with, with two, two colors. Uh, but I'm not going to clean the gun out. So I am using PPS cups. So if you guys are just using a regular cup, what I would do is just pour that back into, when you're done with one color, pour that into the cup that you mix it in, and then go right to your second color, pour it right into your gun. You don't have to worry about really scrubbing and cleaning it because a little bit of that blend, 50-50 or whatever's left over, is gonna help with that transition. So, this is exactly what I'm talking about. And I can see that was like a coat and a half, just a double pass, and it is a little bit wet. And I didn't hammer this on. There is a little bit of orange peel to that, and that's, I'm not concerned about that. We're not trying to get this flowed out. What we're more concerned with is how even that candy looks applied, right? So again, when you're spraying candies, it's key that you have a nice, smooth, 75% overlap, nice and consistent across the panel. I'm not moving in and out, moving out. I'm, I'm being real methodical in how even I am across my, my panel itself. You don't want to arc it and get real real far away at the edges and real tight in the middle because that's going to change the color. So this is still what I would call wet. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of my Tealicious and go to my Ultraviolet, which is mixed the exact same way. Four to one, little splash of 4011. When I say splash, it's probably like 5% maybe, not even, you know, 2%, just enough to kind of help flow a little bit. So I'm going to go right into my ultraviolet. what I'm talking about. So now, all of this overspray, all of that, uh, what would otherwise sometimes look like grainy overspray, little droplets, is going to melt into that semi-wet uh, candy that's already been applied. And that is a, a nice trick for doing a seamless kind of a candy fade where you don't, if I was way back here spraying, you still, even though it is candy, you still run the risk of having these little droplets where Again, this is not something that I talk about doing all the time when you're spraying base coats. Everything I'm always stressing, uh, you know, even the clear, just let each coat dry before you go to the next. But something like this, where you do want to get that blunt, it's not uh, a, a terrible thing to do. Because again, you'll see I'm not hammering this product on. I'm just trying to get it to softly blend in. You can see that color transition already. I went a little down here with my Tealicious, and I went a little up here with my Ultraviolet. So now we have that Tealicious to that, it almost has that carob kind of marine blue band in here, and then it goes right down to the ultraviolet. So if I wanted to, I could continue spraying a little more on the bottom and darken this up, and I can darken up the tealicious too, but kind of give you an idea of exactly what it was that I was talking about. So 
that pretty much wraps up this video. And uh, I guess we'll see you guys next time. So thanks for checking us out. For Create Text Colors, I'm Chris Harper.